Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Anita Huberman. I'm CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade and also an honorary captain of the Royal Canadian Navy appointed by Canada's National Defence Minister. Thank you so much for joining us this Friday. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the treaty territory of the Tawasin First Nations and the unceded territory of our, the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen Kaitsi and Semiamu First Nations. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Inuit and Métis peoples as well. Events like this simply do not happen without sponsorship support. Thank you so much to our co-presenting sponsors, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, also known as KPU, and Simon Fraser University, also known as SFU. Our community sponsor is BC Egg and the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. Thank you also to our business and international trade center sponsors, the law firm of Baskin, the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan represented by SNF Benefits, BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada, and Scotia Bank. If you're starting a business, need business support, need international connections or trade documentation, visit the Surrey Board of Trades Business and International Trade Center. We are now open for in-person service. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some government officials that are with us on the meeting call today, representing Pam Alexis, MLA for Abbotsford Mission, are Joanne Chadwick and Seamus Heffernan. Megan Dykeman, MLA for Langley East, representing Trevor Halford, MLA for Surrey White Rock, Isafi Cerise. Ian Patton, MLA for Delta South, and the official opposition critic for Agriculture and Food. Mike Starchuk, MLA for Surrey Cloverdale. City of Surrey Councillors Linda Annis and Stephen Pettigrew. And we also have with us the Consul General of Ireland in Vancouver, Mr. Frank Flood. Thank you so much for being with us. Just some instructions before we begin. All attendees are muted. If you have a question, please put it in the chat function of the technology. We'll get to it during the question period. If we're not able to get to your question, a response will be sent to you by email. I also just wanted to start off by saying that Surrey is going to be the largest city in British Columbia by 2030. A third of Surrey's land base is agricultural. We have the greatest number of manufacturers in British Columbia right here in Surrey, an international docking facility bringing in goods from all over the world. And we have the human capital. So people who are looking to relocate their businesses here, this is where the human capital is. And you'll be hearing from our sponsors shortly about that, how they are part of the economic development foundation of our city, of our province. And I also wanted to indicate that during this pandemic, we have been a concierge of connections for businesses, being one of nine organizations as part of the Premier's Economic Recovery Task Force, as well as a direct line into the Prime Minister's office, identifying gaps and opportunities for businesses. Every single business matters. Every single person matters as part of our workforce paradigm. And I wanted to just introduce to you uh, the Associate Dean, Faculty of Science from Simon Fraser University, our co-presenting sponsor, David Hick, to speak to you about what SFU is doing for the agricultural industry sector. David, over to you. Thank you, Nita. I'm uh, delighted the Surrey Board of Trade organized today's event, and it, it's just great to see so much interest in the future of agriculture. At Simon Fraser University, we're excited to be developing a new educational program in, in agricultural innovation to support the needs of the region, the, the province, and the country. 
our proposed agricultural innovation program is really framed around the emerging demands of the fourth agricultural revolution. And, and it's being designed to harness new and innovative applications of data and technology to ensure that food production is more sustainable and will lead to greater long-term food security. Uh, we're designing this as a joint degree between the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Applied Sciences, and it will be based at the SFU Surrey campus. And what we're trying to do is fill a niche in, in the BC higher education system that complements what already exists. So we have been working closely with other post-secondary institutions, with, with growers and communities and agri-tech companies as we design the program. And we're looking at new ways to provide students with skills and, and knowledge in both sustainable agriculture, uh, technology and engineering. So courses will include you know, obvious content on biology and crop science, but all of that integrated with data science, design engineering, sustainability, and, and other related disciplines that can bring new innovation into the agri-food system. So our goals are really to provide students with some distinct opportunities to create solutions that are critical for the transformation of our food system through interdisciplinary and problem-based learning. And you know, next year, uh, 2022, will be the 20th anniversary of the Surrey campus. And we're hopeful that maybe a, a new Agri Innovation Program might even be part of those celebrations. So your keynote speaker today was, was elected MLA for Saanich South in 2009 and re-elected in 2013 and 2017. Currently, she is BC's Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries. She served on Saanich's Planning, uh, Transportation and Economic Development Committee and on the uh, Peninsula Agricultural Commission. She was also president of the Vancouver Island Grape Growers Association, chair of the Certification Committee for the Island's Organic Producers Association, and a member of the Investment Agriculture Board. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Honourable Lannan Popham. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, hello, everyone. I can't see you all, but I know that you're all out there. It's such a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Thank you so much, Anita, for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to be speaking with you today from the traditional territories of the Wasanic peoples here <clears throat> on the Saanich Peninsula in Cordova Bay, where I live. Um, it's a, it's a windy and cloudy day, which seems so unusual these days. And we are potentially getting a bit of rain tonight, which seems like a miracle. It's so hot and dry around our province. Um, thanks so much to the Surrey Board of Trade for the invitation to participate in this really important conversation on food security. Um, I could, we, I wish we had a conference that went all day. There's so much to say about it, but there's a lot to talk about around framing Surrey uh, as a leader in agritech, and I'm excited about that. The past 16 months were incredibly difficult for everyone, and uh, I can't. I, I'm sure everybody can say that our mental well-being, uh, our physical well-being, it was all affected by the pandemic. Everybody showed a lot of resilience and strength and flexibility, uh, especially in Surrey. That's what the business community in Surrey is known for, and I'm really proud of the way you adapted your businesses <clears throat> to health restrictions and implemented new ways to ensure that customers were safe. Uh, everyone's had to innovate. You've had to innovate in so many instances in the way you've done your business. And now we're going into step three of our restart plan and restrictions are easing and we're slowly moving back to a, a sense of normalcy. Um, so from the bottom of my heart, I wanna thank you for your, your strength and, and resilience and, and for keeping your community safe uh, and just for allowing BC to emerge out of this incredibly difficult situation with strength. As the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, the past year has taken on a completely different tone. There's been a heightened awareness around food supply. And we saw that at the beginning of the pandemic with some uh, over uh, excited and over enthusiastic shopping, I'd like to say. Um, and so I think we're actually in a quite good time around awareness around food security and what we need to do to make sure that we are more food secure in BC. 
Um, since becoming government back in 2017, uh, I was appointed minister then, and I've had my ministry really focus on establishing a foundation of more self-sufficiency around the entire province. And this uh, foundation that we've been creating enables uh, domestic stability by creating a food system that connects the soil, the farmer, our communities, our business communities, food entrepreneurs, and the enormous market that is BC, Canada, North America, and the globe. I'm always looking for innovative new ways to help increase the productivity of our agricultural food and seafood sectors. And I don't have to look very far because there's innovation happening everywhere I look. It's critical to BC's food system that we invest and support technology in uh, these sectors to improve efficiency. We have to maintain a high standard of safety and quality in the food we produce. That's what we're known for around the globe. Um, but we also have opportunities to uh, uh, have adapt adaptability as far as climate change goes, which is also one of the ways that into the future, we will gain public trust in, in what we're doing. Agriculture and food production contribute so much to our province. It, it, it looks different in urban British Columbia than it does in rural British Columbia, but Agritech uh, covers the whole province. We're seeing it everywhere, even in rural BC. And we need to be able to support uh, companies to uh, enable that technology to, to support what we're doing. We have over 150 Agritech companies that are already operating. And that's, I believe, because we have some built-in advantages for developing Agritech here. For one thing, we have an advantage over uh, other provinces such as the prairies because we have a diverse landscape. Our geography is quite different. We have over 200 land-based commodities, uh, over 100 sea-based commodities, and a thriving tech sector, and, and very importantly, a strong research community. Technology now plays an important role in how we produce food locally. As I said, it's everywhere and it's in the most interesting places. <clears throat> I can tell you that when we were traveling before the pandemic, um, technology and agritech was popping up uh, everywhere I went, every road trip I went on. Um, up in, for example, up in Salmon Arm, uh, a company called Valid Manufacturing is creating a centrifuge to help reduce um, effluent from uh, dairy farms to, to, to manage manure so it doesn't end up into our waterways. Uh, incredible agritech there. Um, we've got processors and uh, agritech developing new types of products and improving on packaging to reduce waste. All of this uh, excitement around agritech this will enable entrepreneurs to reach their dreams of, of uh, building a business, expanding a business, selling the technology to other customers around the world. But it's all starting here. Applying technology to agriculture, it, it will increase our competitiveness. Uh, obviously, we talk a lot about resilience these days and food security. It's going to allow us to move into more sustainable models of production. In many cases, um, we see companies that are developing ways so we have less inputs, which reduces costs and it leaves a smaller footprint uh, on the earth. So there's a lot of reasons for us to be uh, bullish on agritech. There's um, uh, a lot of investment that we've already done. We recently invested uh, about seven and a half million dollars in our Agritech grant program, and our investments are already getting results. In Surrey, you have a great example of this in artificially inspired technologies. They've built and piloted a robot strawberry harvester, which finds ripe strawberries, picks them, doesn't damage the fruit, doesn't damage the plant, and it's easier on everybody's backs. Uh, so this type of technology really helps us address some of the labor shortages that we're seeing in agriculture. There's a company that's currently developing some of the same type of technology for mushroom picking, which is also uh, facing um, difficult labor shortages. Uh, but we see, we see all types of things. We see drones that are working up in vineyards 
that detect disease faster than the human eye can detect it. So are able to get on top of disease management faster, which reduces inputs. Um, we see uh, dairies that are using Agritech to take the temperature of their cows to address any health issues before they become serious. It's literally everywhere. And so we're working hard to support these types of businesses and technology as they develop. So we also, uh, it's important as we, as we support these businesses, we figure out how to foster new investments that will make farming more sustainable. And there is really a focus on climate change, especially after we, we, what we've just gone through with the heat dome. Uh, I was at a, a federal provincial territorial meeting with other ag ministers across the country yesterday morning. And uh, climate change has always been part of the discussion in those meetings, but it was really front and center because there's no ignoring um, the issue of how climate is affecting our, our uh, agriculture sector. The western provinces, BC not so much, but Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, they're facing such severe drought that they're looking at downsizing their uh, cattle herds. And so this is this is really serious. British Columbia, we still have that advantage of having a diverse geography. So we do see rain right now up in the Stikine and Prince George coming in. Um, so there's areas of the province that are are doing okay, but we also have severe drought in other areas. And of course, we have fires right now that are threatening some agricultural uh, businesses that it's quite sad. So there's a dairy operation up in Ashcroft right now that actually burnt to the ground in 2017 during forest fires. And now they're facing the exact same situation again this year. So um, my heart is with them for sure. Um, Agritech creates new jobs, of course. It, creates different kind of jobs. And um, I think everybody who's in the food producing industry understands that we have to we have to get across some of these hurdles where there's uh, intense labor um, and we need to be able to figure out how to reduce some of that dependency on human labor. Uh, that doesn't mean we're getting rid of jobs, but we're just creating different jobs. We bring in about 12,000 uh, temporary foreign workers to work with us in our food industry. Many of them, the majority come from Mexico. And we've had a, a very good program in place uh, during the pandemic to protect everybody. Uh, from not getting uh, COVID, but um, it's a great expense and we would like to see more domestic labor and we would like to be able to see Agritech support different types of labor, uh, labor that starts with technology. So um, one of my most favorite uh, projects uh, since 2017 is creating a BC Food Hub Network. And so what we're doing is we're putting shared use processing facilities into communities. We're up to about 12 now uh, where food entrepreneurs can have access to cutting edge equipment uh, at all times of day, taking away barriers for uh, small businesses to start. We're offering business supports for the first three years until the food hub is able to stand on its own. And uh, you've got one right here in Surrey, Plenty and Grace Food Hub and Innovation Center was one of our first food hubs in BC. As I said, we've got we've got up to a dozen. We hope to be announcing a couple, maybe two or three more this year, depending on on what type of food hub is announced. Um, it's a it's a really interesting way of increasing small businesses around food and the products that are coming out of these food hubs are incredible. If anybody's interested in in taking a tour of any of the food hubs that we have in the lower mainland, uh, let me know because you will be astounded at uh, the excitement and the entrepreneurship and just the just the general. Um, uh, well, it, it's amazing. I love I love visiting them. We've got one that's operating in Vancouver that's open 24 hours a day and opens via a, a little fob. So food entrepreneurs make the times work for them and uh, they don't have to have that big outlay for for cutting edge equipment. It's a it's a great project. Plenty and Grace has a resident chef named Julian Bond and he's collaborated with Vista Doro Farms in Langley and chef Robert Clark from Organic Ocean. They've collaborated to make a delicious malt free 
fish and chip vinegar using um, BC apples and BC hops. It's coming to store shelves this summer, I understand. I can't wait to try it. But that's a, an example of, of what's happening. It's seed to shelf. And it, that was the vision of the food hubs. And we see that happening uh, all over BC, including in rural BC. So it's an, it's an excellent economic generator. Uh, it's attracting younger folks into the food hubs as they come forward with their incredible food ideas. Um, of course, we can't have uh, high quality products made from high quality uh, primary growing without having access to farmland. The ALR, it's always a hot topic and you basically need a suit of armor anytime you address any changes that are needed. Um, but we took on our revitalization project in 2017 to make sure we were addressing present issues faced by farmers and landowners in the ALR. And over the past few years, I think we've made uh, good progress. It's been tough, but we've made good progress. And we know that um, we really we need to secure farmland and we need to secure farmers, but we also need to uh, look at what else is happening in the ALR uh, and the opportunities there. And we also need to acknowledge farm families and also families who aren't farming. So just uh, earlier this week, we announced some regulatory changes that are going to allow some more residential flexibility on the ALR. Our goal from the outset was, uh, has been to revitalize the ALR, but we also may have to make sure that we're not um, threatening the integrity of the ALR, which really is, uh, it's one of the, the most interesting land use tools that I know about. And uh, there's a lot of other jurisdictions that wish that they would have taken the steps to protect their ag land like British Columbia did because there's areas that have developed over top of their food growing lands. <clears throat> they don't have the same opportunities that we do now. So um, what we did is we, uh, we went out on a road show. We listened to a lot of input from farmers and non-farmers. Um, and uh, I think we've landed in a place that protects the integrity of that land and offers uh, some new housing choices for people. So this rule takes effect uh, December 31st. It's going to streamline the approval for a small secondary residence. This can be used uh, to um, house farm labor. It can be an agritourism accommodation. You can rent it out for supplemental income. Under the previous government, only family members were allowed to have this space on the ALR parcel, uh, most commonly in a mobile home. We've opened that up to folks outside the family and we've expanded the type of dwelling from mobile homes. You will still need permission from your local government or your First Nations government, uh, but there will be no application to the Agricultural Land Commission. So I believe that these changes have provided a lot of flexibility. You can have a secondary residence that looks like a garden suite, a guest house, or a manufactured home. And um, we hope that this will assist uh, farmland owners. If you're not farming, we hope it'll encourage them to partner with new farmers to get their land into production and to also address the needs of British Columbian families. We have, um, having an option for housing opens up new doors to families, but I also think that one of the things we heard most from new farmers is that they didn't have anywhere to live. They, they could lease some land, but there was, they'd have to travel and commute to that land in order to farm it as a business. So we have put in place a land matching program, and that's why we've been hearing from these young folks. Um, we have been uh, finding landowners that don't want to farm, or maybe they're retiring, and but they still want to see their land in production. They still want to be part of the food security solution. And so we created a database with uh, landowners and new farmers looking for land. And uh, we've done so many incredible matches. So the land matching program has found over 100 farmers and matched over 5,000 acres of land so far. So it's, it's an incredible milestone that we've reached. In Surrey, <clears throat> the program has made 12 matches, over 36 acres of farmland has come into production. This has included uh, market gardens, 
a garlic farm, a bee farm, and a buffalo dairy. One such match is at Brave Child Farm in Surrey. Many of you have probably heard of it. Yuko Suda was matched with two landowners in Surrey a few years ago and is now running a thriving farm business with her business partner, uh, Mike Miller. Yuko and Mike grow over 40 types of vegetables on their ecologically run small scale farm with a focus on Asian vegetables that aren't widely available locally. Um, each match, whether small or large, it adds to our next generation of agricultural leaders. And I'm really excited to see the success that Brave Child Farms has had and how they're providing delish, delicious local food to their community. So please spread the word. We're here to help farm, farmers farm and food businesses grow. It's so important to me that we offer and uh, offer and support initiatives that have agri-tech and innovation, market growth, food safety, with the end goal of strengthening our provincial food system and supporting our communities and local economies. Please remember that our government is here to support you and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much and back to you, Anita. Thank you so much, Lana. And before we go into the question period, I wanted to ensure that everyone heard, including you, uh, the message from our co-presenting sponsor, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, um, Dr. Alan Davis. Dr. Alan Davis, over to you. Thanks, Anita. Minister Popham, thank you for your words to the Surrey community today. You, you are, of course, a longtime friend of KPU and your interest and support has been inspiring for our sustainable agriculture, our research institution, institutes for sustainable horticulture and sustainable food systems, and our farm schools, the research farm, and of course our superb uh, school of horticulture. We, we appreciate the authenticity that you bring to your portfolio as an organic farmer yourself. And I'm really pleased to see uh, our colleagues, Simon Fraser, uh, joining in this endeavor and can't wait to see, uh, look at some partnerships and uh, collaboration between their Agri-Innovation uh, Center uh, up in, Sur uh, here in Surrey. Uh, I'll use my few seconds here just to sort of reiterate something about what we believe here at KPU and, and, and thus what we study and teach, which is that we need ethical and purposeful innovation, especially for smallholder agriculture, which is largely what we have in BC. Uh, the sustainable future of the planet requires equally sustainable food systems and alongside the right agri-tech, we need to protect our agricultural land, support farmers to engage in ecologically based practices, train the next generation of farmers and strengthen regional supply chains, which it, I really pleased to hear some of the uh, initiatives that you were talking about and support the right research and food system data collection. Uh, so there's a lot of activities you've heard today from myself and my colleague at SFU. There's a lot of work going on at, at the universities here. Uh, we, we have great hope that all this will be the case under your leadership, Minister, and thank you again for being here. Thank Thanks, you. Anita. Thank you so much. And, and Minister, um, I wanted to ask you, in light of our sponsors that really provide the human capital, uh, the commercialization of businesses related to this industry sector, what is your perspective on labor needs, uh, whether it's um, agriculture, traditional agricultural mechanisms or even ag tech? What's your perspective on that for the future of BC's economy today and tomorrow? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, and, and we've been grappling with that for the last few years and especially coming out of the pandemic. So uh, as I said, we bring in a lot of temporary foreign workers specifically to support um, our agriculture sector. And uh, we have a great relationship with the Mexican consulate. Uh, the majority of our workers do come from Mexico, but at the same time, we're very dependent. So how do you incent domestic workers to become involved? And, um, you know, 
where where are we going as far as the needs that agritech brings are we prepared and so when i look at the partnerships that we have with our our uh, educational institutions it's really critical that we're working um side by side because uh, we are going to need a different type of educational base that's going to emerge to support agritech but at the same time we will still have a traditional style of farming that's happening um, it's funny, a, a lot of people say and have said over the last uh, many years that I've been involved that we're, we're losing our farmers. The average age of a farmer is getting on and new, uh, young people aren't, uh, they're not interested in becoming farmers. Uh, I couldn't disagree more. When I travel around the province, I do see a bit of a renaissance that's happening with the idea of food production. So we do have a lot of new and young farmers that are entering back in to agriculture or entering for the first time. Uh, it's not the same type of agriculture that people might imagine, but um, it's uh, medium, smaller scale. It's often uh, sustainable practices uh, are being used and they're interested in addressing food security and climate change at the same time. And so with that being said, we are creating a regenerative agriculture network where we're trying to embrace the idea of uh, farming with nature in mind. And um, this isn't just a small and medium scale idea. We see larger farms in BC that are also interested in how they can uh, incorporate regenerative agriculture. Agritech's going to help us uh, uh, create this network. One of the things in particular is how can we sequester more carbon on farms? How can agriculture be more of a solution? And so we need uh, to address the, the labor shortages. Uh, generally, we're, we're grappling with that. It's not, a, it's not an easy uh, solution but we also know that we're going to need our uh, post-secondary education institutions to help us get there as far as training goes on the other fronts. And so it's we're all gonna have to work together. Absolutely. And Minister, during the pandemic, you know, we really realized, I, I think in reality, how important it was uh, to ensure food security systems, um, those supply chains, uh, whether it's uh, domestically or internationally. I, I wanted to get your perspective, uh, you know, KPU's Horticulture Institute, uh, uh, they recently released a report around uh, the in amazing opportunity around being sustainable around our own food systems here in British Columbia. So we're not having to rely so much on international markets. So it means a different way of eating, you know, maybe not uh, eating mangoes, uh, you know, in the, in the winter. Uh, but uh, what's your perspective on that? I'm so glad you asked this question because I have very strong feelings about this and it's really driven the model that we're using within the agriculture ministry now. Um, I think in the past we failed to have a strong enough focus on the domestic market as a foundation for us. And so the work that KPU has done has really influenced the way that um, I've been able to incorporate some of my thoughts. Uh, into how we're doing things. Uh, KPU puts forward the idea that there's a bioregional model that we can use. So it's looking at each region of our province as an economic driver and embracing what that region offers, uh, which is why we're placing food processing hubs into each region so they can access their own primary products. And um, when you look at uh, uh, climate change um, issues and interruptions, uh, uh, whether it's a health interruption, any interruptions we have in our food system, we're stronger if we have the strength of our regions to, if one region gets cut off, we've got another region to back us up. Also, it changes the way people embrace what we're doing locally and how they're spending their dollars locally. Um, the stronger our domestic foundation is, the more opportunities we have internationally, because we also believe that trade is important. But I'm just gonna give you a really quick story of how the pandemic affected a business. There's a business up um, uh, off of Vancouver Island. It's a seafood company and their entire business model was based on international sales. 
they mostly sold their products to Japan. When the pandemic struck, everything stopped and they had to quickly figure out how they were going to run their business uh, and survive financially through the pandemic. They shifted their entire model to 100% domestic. They started doing home deliveries uh, on the North Island. They moved up the island. Now they're into Vancouver. Um, they embraced the power of our own consumers here in BC. And as now we move back into being able to do trade more um, uh, again, uh, they're not going to go back to a fully international model because they've realized that they've got a lot of um, stability in the domestic market. And then the international market is really the gravy. And so um, we see that happening with other uh, food businesses as well. So we've got an incredible almost 5 million people here that are willing to support us. Uh, and but if we look at each region, we can't leave any region out because it's going to be critical uh, as we talk about sustainability that every region is is in, um, involved. Minister, uh, you know, as you know, um, the Premier was here in Surrey, uh, I, I believe in September 2018. Uh, we were at SFU as, as, as part of a press conference, um, uh, you know, just announcing the Quantum Computing Institute and the innovation related to commercialization. And today, just now, uh, the Premier of British Columbia announced the BC Centre for Innovation and Clean Energy. And certainly Surrey is a, a part of that. Can you just indicate your perspective on, you know, do you think BC agriculture can do more to decarbonize? Um, you know, uh, what's your perspective on that? Thank you. So another great question. So this is where um, I feel that uh, agriculture can be part of the solution with climate change. Often fingers are pointed at it as as being one of the foes of climate change. And in, in some cases, that's true. But we do have the opportunity to uh, add technology into the way we're growing things and processing things that definitely lessens our footprint. Um, we did have some uh, tragic events happen during the heat dome experience that we all went through a few weeks ago within our poultry industry. There was some failures on some poultry barns and we lost um, 700,000 uh, pol uh, poultry during that time. Very devastating for the farmers. We need to look at ways to control heat and we, I think we've talked to a lot of lucky folks in our communities that have heat pumps well, the agriculture community can also start incorporating technology like heat pumps, et cetera, to lessen our footprint, but also to be more resilient when, when we are going through these climate incidents. We're going to go through them over and over again, so we have to be prepared. Luckily, the federal government is uh, creating pockets of money for us to draw from to help businesses transition into more of a, a low carbon uh, solution. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that. The agriculture community is very keen on figuring out how to lessen its footprint because uh, as I said at, during my talk, this is a way also to make sure that there's consumer trust there. You know, we were uh, really concerned uh, when the city of Surrey removed uh, their agricultural lands uh, committee because the partnership uh, with the private sector and government, uh, all levels of government to ensure better outcomes, uh, you know, wherever it may be around industry and labor innovation uh, was very important uh, to move this industry sector along. You sent a letter uh, to the city of Surrey indicating your concerns. Did you get a response? Um, I, I think that uh, it was maybe a little bit surprising that I had weighed in on that issue, but agriculture, the, the, the importance of agriculture to our province is enormous. It's a huge economic generator, but again, it also is going to allow us to uh, be more resilient when we face climate situations. We have to have it in place, and Surrey does have a third of its property in the ALR. So <clears throat> you can't, in my view, you can't really operate Surrey without acknowledging agriculture. Um, and so the reason why I weighed in is uh, because um, I don't know of any community really that hasn't uh, realized 
that food security is one of the biggest uh, issues that we're going to face around the globe. And so it just seemed like a really bad decision. Um, but I know that people have stepped up and created their own agricultural communities. And we also have an amazing outreach to farmers in Surrey, but um, it has to go hand in hand with the business community and the decisions that are being made uh, around, uh, for example, the agricultural land reserve, um, uh, business proposals, figuring out the best way to be the wind at the back of entrepreneurs, it all has to go hand in hand. So agriculture can't stand alone. And uh, I think that's really what the message was when the committee got disbanded is that agriculture is on its own and, and agriculture runs through the veins of every community. And through so many ancillary businesses. As Absolutely. Well. Um, Minister, I wanted to get your perspective on the tension between uh, industrial lands, employable lands, as well as uh, the ALR piece. Uh, so there's this proposal on the table uh, in the South Campbell Heights area. And uh, there are some that are indicating it's going to really impact food security or climate change. And then there are others that are saying, well, this is an opportunity to create good quality jobs. And we need that, especially as we move beyond the economic, uh, beyond the pandemic, I mean. Uh, so what's your perspective uh, when, we're, when communities are facing this tension? So I think that tension has existed since the beginning of the inception of the Agricultural Land Reserve. There has always been tension between um, agricultural lands and development. There's been tension between agricultural lands and housing, housing development. Uh, the reason why agricultural land is so expensive now is because uh, the, it, it has been considered in some ways a land bank for development. Uh, just wait long enough and you'll be able to move forward uh, and develop something. We have a really great commission in place that's very customer service focused now. Um, Kim Grout is the CEO and you could literally phone Kim's number and she'll answer the phone and talk to you about an agricultural issue. And so we're hoping that the tensions that are involved with development <clears throat> and protecting agricultural land and getting it into production might be lessened as people see ways forward and uh, look at other alternatives. And so um, we do have a lot of agricultural land that people say it's not in production, so it's wasted land. It should be used for something else. But the integrity of the agricultural land reserve really uh, is necessary to, to see that the, the land isn't disconnected and there are holes in the agricultural land reserve running through communities because as soon as you start to uh, develop holes in the ALR, uh, the integrity lessens and there will be more opportunity for land to be removed. And so I think that the, the focus of uh, keeping agricultural land into production is the thing that I'm most concerned about. We don't wanna see fallow land. If land really is uh, has lost its integrity and isn't available to really uh, be there for the production that it should, then the commission has the opportunity to make different decisions about the future of that land. But the idea of food security uh, and land development is not new. It's been there as long <clears throat> as the ALR has existed. And you did say to me um, before that um, you know, if anyone does have any ideas or any uh, specific perspectives around the Agricultural Land Commission, uh, that you, we can just pick up the phone and phone the CEO and, and she picks up the phone and, and listens, yes. is that correct? That's very true. I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna say you're not gonna get a voicemail once in a while, but she's very accessible. And I really think it's, uh, if you're thinking of, uh, if, if you have questions around a piece of land and ideas of, around what you wanna do with it, um, it's really a great first point of contact because uh, there will really be kind of a, a checklist of things that you need to do. Um, local government is very, very involved in decisions that are made around what can happen in the Agricultural Land Reserve, but the Agricultural Land Commission can certainly set out a set of parameters that you have to work within and give you ideas on how, how to work within those parameters as well that you might not know about. So it's always a great 
first resource is to go to the commission. People seem to think that it's um, it's not accessible, and I I do agree that that has been the case in the past, but now it's very open open for discussion. Can you explain why the BC government recently uh, increased housing flexibility on agricultural lands? Yeah, great, great question. So one of the things we heard on our big road trip was that we do have landowners that they don't necessarily want to be farmers, but they do own ALR land. They have needs that uh, are there that might not have been uh, in the past, such as having family live with them at the same location. Um, uh, new landowners that need haven't started farming yet that might need a mortgage helper so they were able to have a rental accommodation. We heard a lot of things that seemed quite reasonable to us. And so uh, allowing for a secondary residence without having to go to the Agricultural Land Commission seemed to reduce red tape for one thing and give families uh, a small opportunity to have some flexibility on the land that they own. So it mostly is a benefit for people who don't farm. Uh, it's not a very big secondary residence. It can be a, a wooden structure. It can be, it can be almost anything, but it's um, 940 square feet. So it's not that big. It's like an apartment size, but it does give that opportunity to have family members or, or childcare right uh, where you live. Farmers, uh, on the other hand, have a ton more opportunity than that. So if you're a farming family, you need to have a bigger home than the allowable 5,400 square feet. Uh, if you need to have a secondary home, if you need to have a third home to support your farming business, if you really require it to support that business, you can apply to the Agricultural Land Commission and they support applications that support farming. But this decision was for everyone else. Farmers can use it as well, but it really, um, it, it, it was necessary to reflect where we are with housing in British Columbia and what we need to do to get more people onto the land base to farm. Often our international trade center here at the Board of Trade receives questions about, I'm making lentils or I want to uh, ship my wine to international markets. CBC. And uh, how is the provincial government working with federal and uh, provincial counterparts to ensure that Canada's export-based objectives in the ag sector are being met? Uh, so time, time, timing is everything. We just had a FPT meeting uh, where trade was discussed. We have, this was our pre FPT meeting before we have an official one uh, in September, but trade is on the agenda. So we have some very high targets that we want to meet as a country. And so we participate in those talks around strategy. Um, we are we are at a in a unique position in British Columbia. We probably align as far as pro production and, and variety of products, we align really well with Quebec in that way. Um, both Quebec and BC are focusing heavily on securing that domestic base and then using that power to go out into the international community. So we are known for our healthy, safe, clean food. And um, people are looking not just for the uh, label that says it's from Canada, but BC has its own reputation now. And so our Buy BC logo that's on our products is not just for British Columbian consumers, it's for, it's for the world and it's being recognized that way. We see other provinces now uh, using a similar uh, Buy BC logo for their provinces and uh, also embracing a lot of the domestic strategies that we have. For example, using um, much more grown and processed food within our hospital system and our post-secondary food systems. So interprovincial uh, barriers, trade barriers still remains an issue. And uh, not only for the agricultural sector, but for, for other pieces as well. And so, you know, we urge uh, the BC government to ensure that there are no trade barriers Absolutely. within our own country. Uh, that simply does not make any sense. Yeah, well, that comes up in my file a lot with wine, and that file continues to be worked on. But yes, point taken, and we will continue to work on that. My final question to you is. Um, 
ALR needs flexibility in enabling creative ag use of land for revenue. Uh, farmland needs to be protected from speculation and taxed at a rate, enabling it to be sustainable. How can this be addressed from your perspective? Uh, it's not an, uh, there's not an instant fix for that complicated situation, but one of the things which I referred to earlier is that if the agricultural land reserve is considered a land bank for development, the housing that the land costs are going to go up. So with our revitalization project, we've tried to make it very clear that farmland is for food production and uh, allowing for a little bit of flexibility around uh, residential needs was really a way to say, uh, we're not unreasonable, but we all need this food growing land for the future. So right now we're looking at what, does, what is the picture of food growing in BC? As we see agri-tech coming in, we see vertical farming being very popular. Um, what are the changes that we need to make in order to support food production on the ALR while protecting the integrity of that very good soil? If we can uh, manage to get that message out to everybody that it's not for housing, it's not for industry, it's for food, I think in the long run, you will see the, the cost of that land, the price of that land being put into check. I mean, it's, it's mostly out of grasp for farmers right now anyway, but we're trying to put in this uh, checkpoint that's like, no, it's not for those other things. We all need it. It's for the greater good of British Columbia. Minister, any closing remarks? Uh, I, well, I think I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, making it through a very difficult year. It's been tough. We're coming out of it. We're coming out of it strong. That doesn't mean that there's not going to need, we're not going to need support along the way. But um, from my perspective, from the agriculture, fish and food perspective, what I'm requesting is that make a little extra effort to go out and support BC products. It means everything to farmers right now who are facing uh, climate change incidences that are affecting their businesses, but we've got tons of food out there. There's tons of BC food. Go out and get it and, uh, you know, thank a farmer on social media. It all mean, it means everything to them right now. And it also means everything to the communities that farmers operate in. So many businesses rely on farming businesses and food businesses. So um, get out there and buy BC. Minister, thank you for joining the Surrey Board of Trade this morning, and I look forward to seeing you in person in Surrey very soon. Uh, thank you so much to our co-presenting sponsors, Kwantlen Polytechnic University and Simon Fraser University. Our supporting sponsors are BC Egg and the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. Check out all of our upcoming programs and services at businessinsurrey.com. Remember, Surrey is an opportunity city. Make it a great business day.